Man, it's nice to see so many people this evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, today's topic is going to be new minimally invasive options for the treatment of degenerative spinal conditions of the lumbar spine. Degenerative conditions are those conditions which occur over time. So we're talking about repetitive trauma, wear and tear, aging. Before I begin, I would like to thank Mazer Robotic for inviting me to speak this evening, as well as Foundation Hospital. If you haven't guessed, I'm Dr. Dean Smith. I'm a board-certified, fellowship-trained orthopedic spinal surgeon, and I specialize in minimally invasive surgery of the cervical, thoracic, and lower back, lumbar spine. I've been here in El Paso, Texas since 1992, so quite a while. What is minimally invasive surgery? Minimally invasive surgery is surgery which is designed to produce the least amount of damage to normal tissue in the process of fixing whatever pathology. Obviously, you're going to have to cut normal muscle, tendon, some bone to get to the pathology, but the goal is to damage the associated or collateral tissue the least amount possible. And really, we do that by one of two ways. One way is by using a very small incision. It's supposed to be going back. I guess it is going back. By using a very small incision. And also, by picking a path which is more direct to the area of pathology. So for example, in the past, classically what we've done is if somebody had a damaged disc in the lower back, we would make an incision on the lower back. You'd cut the muscle, ligaments, tendons, strip the muscle from the bone, do what they call a laminectomy, take off the back half of the spinal cord, move the nerves all out of the way, all in an attempt to get to the disc, which is actually closer to the front, as you'll see in a minute. So. One of the things we'll do with minimally invasive surgery is pick the path on the body which is most direct to the area of pathology. When you look at back pain, what is the chance someone's going to have back pain and sciatica, which is actually leg pain, during their lifetime? It's virtually 100%. In fact, today, back pain is the number one leading cause for expenditures of healthcare dollars in the United States which sounds bad, but the upside to that is that's one of the things that fuels the amount of technology that goes into this field. And it really is amazing how quick the technology changes. I always say that the technology in this field changes quicker than cell phone technology does. If I look at the way that I do surgeries today, I could not have even imagined five, ten years ago that I would be doing those the way I do today, much like if if I tried to explain to somebody five or ten years ago what my cell phone would be like, nobody would believe me. They would think I was crazy, you know? Which also makes me excited about the future because I wonder, you know, I know that the way we're going to be doing this five or ten years from now, we can't even imagine. And now I'm rambling, getting off the subject. <laughs> when you look at back pain, back pain is divided into two types. You have acute, which uh, usually resolves within about six weeks or so. I always say you can sprain your back just like you can sprain an ankle and you treat them both the same way, conservatively, physical therapy, medications. Chronic back pain typically lasts longer than 12 weeks and a certain percentage of those people may go on to need surgery. When you look at the two major comp, you have soft tissue like muscles. Once again, you can sprain your back and that's usually going to resolve with time. But there are certain conditions that involve the nerves. That's like uh, herniated discs, collapsed discs, arthritic conditions, bone spurs, spinal malalignment. Those conditions can pinch a nerve, cause pain in the back, buttock, pain down the leg, which is known as sciatica, can cause numbness, tingling, weakness, difficulty walking. 
and a certain percentage of those people are going to go on to need surgical intervention and of course that's the class that uh, our talk tonight is aimed at. No talk about back pain is complete without mentioning the most important thing which is prevention. You prevent back pain by using those techniques your parents probably told you about when you were a child. When you're lifting things, lift using your hips and knees, use good body mechanics, you need to exercise and stay fit. And also, no medical talk is complete unless the doctor tells you to lose weight and stop smoking. <laughs> Before you consider surgical intervention, you want to exhaust all the conservative treatment options. Uh, I'm not going to go through all those because that's not what our topic is about today, but you want to use physical therapy, medications, epidural injections work frequently. If all of those options have failed, then that's when you want to consider surgical intervention. So the take home message is, even though tonight we're talking about newer, minimally invasive options for the treatment of lower back pain, the actual indications for the surgery haven't changed. You still want to use the conservative techniques prior to considering anything surgically. As I mentioned a minute ago, when you look at the way back pain has classically been treated, it usually involves a big incision on the back. And what we do is we cut the normal tissue, you cut the muscle, the ligaments, tendons, you take the muscle and you strip it off the bone, exposing the back half of the spinal cord, which is called the lamina. When you remove the back of the bony spinal cord, that's called a laminectomy. You've probably heard about that. Below that you have the nerves, you move the nerves, you pull the nerves out of the way, all in an attempt to get to the disc. This is an MRI of the back, and what an MRI is, is it's a magnetic picture of the anatomy of the lumbar spine. So if you look at this, we're looking at the lower back from the side, kind of this point of view. This would be the front, that would be the back, these are the bones in the back, and then between those you have the cushions or the discs. Here you can see this one's kind of collapsed. This is what I call an airplane view. It's like looking from the top down. This is the front, that's the back, right side, left side, these are the nerves, and this is the disc. So a laminectomy typically involves taking out this Y, which is a lamina, and to do that, you strip this muscle off the bone. Now, if we look at this muscle, that's kind of normal looking muscle. If you think about that as a piece of steak, that's a nice piece of beefy red steak with a little bit of marbling in it. If you went out to eat and they served you something like that, that would be good. Now, this is somebody that's had a laminectomy. So what they've done is they've gone back here and they made a little incision and they took out that bony Y. But look what happens to the muscle all the way around the back, all the way from one side to the other. If they served you that piece of meat, you'd probably send it back. So even though they make a small incision, once you strip off that muscle from the bone, you de-innervate that muscle. You take away the nerves, you take away some of the blood supply, and even though the incision may heal and from the outside it looks okay, how long does it take somebody to recover from something like that? Years, probably never. Plus, you've not only done that, you've taken away the bony back half of the spinal cord, weakens the spine, and the muscles that support the spine are now weak. So that's where minimally invasive surgery comes in. And one of the things that's kind of confusing about minimally invasive surgery is they all seem to have the same names. X-lift, T-lift, A-lift, PLIF, axial lift. There's a bunch up there I didn't even put. And the reason for that is unlike other types of surgery, when you talk about minimally invasive surgery, the surgery is named according to where the incision is made. So you may essentially be doing the same thing. Maybe you're going down, taking out a piece of disc, taking a piece of disc away from a nerve, 
but the surgery that you're having may be an A lift, maybe a X lift, T lift, depending upon where the incision is. So hopefully my video will play, but this is an example of somebody on their side. You can see we have marked right there. We use real-time fluoroscopic guidance to actually see inside the body. We make a small incision and we pass a tube down directly to the disc. At the same time, we use spinal cord monitoring, which actually maps out the nerves and gives us some feedback about the health of the nerves. Once we have that tube in place, then actually we can open that tube up as wide as we need to to do whatever it is we need to do. You can open it up just wide enough to take out a little piece of disc, or you can actually open it wide enough to take out the entire bone if somebody has cancer, metastatic breast cancer, or something like that. Or you can take out all of the disc and replace that disc with something, an artificial disc, a cage, a plastic disc, to give support. Because if you've worn out the disc, then the bones come together and the sciatic nerve actually exits out between those bones. So giving some space between those in and of itself can help. Depending upon the amount of instability, we have the ability to put plates and stuff on there like that too if we need to. I usually don't like to do that. And this is an example of a patient that I probably did quite a while ago now. This, I've been using this slide a long time, but here you can see the patient on their side. You can see that they've had previous surgery in the back, and one option would be to make an incision on the back. But if you do that, then what you do is you have to go through the old scar tissue or go around the scar tissue. Either way, you're creating new scar tissue. You're damaging new tissue. You're taking out new muscle, new tendons, new ligaments, taking out more bone, further weakening the spine. All the nerves are back there clumped together from all that scar tissue. Now you have to slowly dissect out those nerves, stretch, <coughs> pull it aside so you can get to the disc. Well, that's where people get nerve damage, get numbness and tingling in their legs because you're pulling on those nerves to get to the disc which is in front. So in this case, what we do is we go straight to the disc. You bypass all that scar tissue and what you're actually doing is you go to the piece of disc that's pinching the nerve and you pull the disc away from the nerve. So you're putting your pressure on the disc itself as opposed to having to pull on the nerves, tug the nerves, dissect the nerves. So that would make this safer. You're much less likely to cut the nerve, which would give you a spinal fluid leak or some type of nerve damage. Plus with the spinal cord monitoring, we know when we've pulled out enough disc that the nerve's happy happier. <laughs> and you wind up with a small incision like this. I usually joke and say we wind up with an incision half the length of my thumb, but I kind of stopped doing that because people would come back to the office and they'd say, you know, it's a little longer than my thumb. Well, your thumb's not the same size as mine, so it's like, you know, but it's a smaller incision, but don't compare it to your thumb. We also have the ability to do it completely endoscopically if we want to. There are certain cases you need to put a cage in there or we may have to open the tube big enough to uh, take out a, a bone if in fact you have cancer. Or we can do it endoscopically. And the way we do that is we have a tube that goes down. Through that tube we have a television. We can look in there and we can see if there's just a piece of disc we want to take out. Um, or we can even take out the entire disc if we want to. And then what we do is we deploy this bag, kind of like an airbag, and then we fill that up full of stem cells under very high pressure. And what that does is that restores the normal height and alignment of those vertebral bodies, and that can relieve the pressure on those nerves. So it's kind of like a way of putting a disc in there, but kind of build it, it's like you build the ship in the bottle. So you put it in there and then you raise it, so to speak. And you use a very small incision and you wind up with something that looks like that. 
I always like to show this. This is a textbook from when I first came to El Paso in 1992. And this is the way I was trained to do that same surgery. Here you can see a picture of the patient on their side. This is the front, that's the back. And here you see the bones and the discs. And the most important thing is look at this incision. It starts below the belly button and heads up into the chest. It's about half the length of the human body. So half the length of the thumb is a lot better. The other one, um, I mean, they can go home the same day. They may stop off at the mall the same day. This guy's going to stop off at the ICU for a while, probably be in the hospital a few days. So it's, that's what I say about it's amazing to me the way the technology has changed um, as it changes faster than cell phone technology does. One of the things that makes this possible and is also fascinating is the spinal cord monitoring. For the first time ever, we have the ability to see what the nerves are doing in live, real time. And what this does is it actually maps out the nerves. It tells us where we are in relationship to those nerves. It also gives us feedback about the health of those nerves. So if I'm pulling some disc away from a nerve, at the beginning of the case, they have certain readings and it may be red, it says the nerve's not working well. Well, as, of, as I'm pulling the nerves away, it changes. It'll go from red to yellow to green and the overall health of the nerve will increase. So we get real lifetime feedback. In the room, typically we have a spinal cord monitoring technician who monitors that and then that's hooked up to a neurologist who's a medical doctor who's board certified in following the cases to see how the nerves are doing and they kind of grade us at the beginning and the end of the case to see how we did. Um, but it really is fascinating as well. People always want to know how the laser plays a role in this. Tonight's talk is about degenerative spinal conditions. Degenerative spinal conditions are where you wear away the disc, you get bone on bone, you get bone spurs that develop and close off the spinal canal. So it usually involves rebuilding something, like putting in a new disc, putting in the balloon I mentioned. Um, so it really doesn't involve the laser too much. A laser is used to remove something that's soft. It's used for a soft piece of disc in a young person. We might take the tube down and take out just that piece of disc. It's used to take away scar tissue because of its ability to dissect through other tissue and protect, um, to take away damaged tissue and protect healthy tissue. Um, and in fact, with the laser, we can actually dissect or make tissue cuts a single cell thickness at a time if we want to. So if you're approaching a nerve and you want to approach it really slow, you can approach it really slow. In fact, you could go out and have a pizza before you get there. <laughs> um, or it's also used for tumors and stuff like that, like the breast cancer that I mentioned a little while ago. It's anything that's very bloody, it works with too. Um, a lot of the different cancers. The robot is something that we use frequently, and we have a model over here that you can look at at the end of the talk. What the robot does is it is a guidance system. It is something that will get the surgeon to a certain point. Um, so for example, if I want to put a screw in a bone and the spot is very small, uh, it will guide us with very precise accuracy to do that. And I always mention that um, it's not politically correct, so you can't say I talked about this, but as the population gets bigger, it becomes more difficult to do minimally invasive surgery in the fact that you have to go through a very large amount of tissue to finally arrive on the, a certain point in the body. If you have a little piece of disc you're trying to find and you have to go through that much tissue, it can be very difficult. If you have the robot, it does it without you having to do anything. So that's obviously easier than doing it yourself. Um, So uh, the robot makes it easier to get to the spot. Um, also, minimally invasive surgery is actually easier to do on people who are 
a little heavier because remember, everybody gets the same size incision. The tube's always the same diameter. In the old technique, if somebody was really heavy, <clears throat> You'd have to make a longer incision to get to the bottom. So you'd wind up with these huge incisions. Now with us, the way we do the technique, size doesn't really affect us that much. You're going to make the same incision, you do the same surgery, so um, it works out very well. What are some of the advantages of minimally invasive surgery uh, over traditional surgery? As we mentioned, with traditional surgery open, uh, you may not walk until the second day, frequently with larger surgeries where you get more than, say, uh, one level fused. They may not get you out of bed until the second post-operative day. That means you're going to be in the hospital four or five days at least. Um, it is a big incision, so people usually donate blood preoperatively, and frequently people will have to have blood transfusions. As far as getting back to normal activities, we mentioned that a minute ago. We, I did. Um, here it says six months. When I trained, we used to tell people it would take two years to get back to normal activity. In reality, probably people never do. I mean, once you do that kind of damage, once you've stripped all that muscle, when you've removed the back half of the spinal cord, it's never normal again, so I don't think they ever really get completely normal activity. When you look at minimally invasive surgery, um, here it says one or two days stay. This is kind of an old slide. Uh, you can tell it's from 2005, so it's kind of an old slide. Um, but nowadays, many people go home the same day. I tend to ask people to spend the night and go home the next day, and probably half the time people do that, half the time people will go home. One of the reasons I do that is because even though I make it sound very simple, the first time you stand up, it does kind of hurt. Once you walk up and down the hallway five long times, the pain is a lot less as everything kind of settles. But if somebody stands up and they think they're going home that day, everyone kind of panics, the family panics. So it's just, I like happy. I usually say just spend the night, plan on going home tomorrow when everything's okay. Um, but you can go home the same day. We do do them at the outpatient surgical center and there, of course, most everybody goes home the same day. Um, as far as donating blood, of course, we never have anybody donate blood and we've never had anybody have to have a blood transfusion. Certainly walking the same day. As far as return to normal activities, when you don't damage all the other tissue, people actually get back to normal activity very quickly. I'm kind of big into Facebook and all that kind of stuff as far as advertising for the business, Instagram, and there's always somebody posting a video of what they did after the surgery. Um, last year we did the head ski instructor for Rio Doso and he posted a video of uh, him skiing again two weeks after it was done. So definitely less than six months for normal activity. Some of the other advantages, once again, you don't damages much tissue. And remember, it's the damaged tissue that tends to get infected. So if you look at traditional open surgeries, what's the chance of somebody getting an infection with that? Well, you can Google it and look it up online. Each hospital has to be listed. But it's, you know, one or two percent. Not a huge amount, but it's certainly there. And if you get that, that is a life-changing event. With uh, minimally invasive surgery, we've never had an infection, so I'm going to knock on wood. <laughs> Bad mojo to say that. Everybody on my team always winces a little bit when I say that. Uh, as far as blood loss, I already mentioned that. We don't have people donate blood preoperatively. There's really no need. We've never had anybody need a blood transfusion. As far as the safety, I kind of alluded to that a few minutes ago. It's certainly much safer because you're going directly to the pathology. You're not spending all those hours um, dissecting through old tissue, so it's a much more rapid surgery. I mean, you're looking at 45 minutes as opposed to half a day. Um, so that leads to less infections, less tissue damage, uh, less blood loss, and safer from all the things I mentioned a minute ago. You're pulling the disc away from the nerve. Um, less likely to get a spinal fluid leak, and also we're monitoring the nerves in real time. So if we start doing something that's irritating a nerve, the whole room lights up. 
I'm gonna mention kind of three conditions that we treat very commonly with this, but before I do that, I'm gonna kind of go over the anatomy a little bit so everybody can keep up with me. Um, here we're looking at the lower back from two points of view. One is from the side and one is an AP view, meaning through the stomach. Here you see the bone, the disc, that's where the nerves are. This would be the back, that would be the front. So classically we would make an incision back here, remove all of this bone and back to get to this nerve, move the nerve aside to get to the disc. Now we go, if it's pinched right there, you go right to that spot and pull the disc away. In the case of degenerative disc disease, what happens is over the course of time, you wear out the disc and you finally get to the point that you have bone rubbing on bone. When bone is rubbing on bone, it develops a bone spur that closes off the spinal canal, producing spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis causes back, buttock, and leg pain. And the way we fix that is we use the tube, we go down, we find where uh, the disc is collapsed, and we place a new disc, restoring the normal height and alignment and unpinching the nerve. The way we diagnose that is with an MRI study once again. And that's like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, a magnetic picture that shows us the anatomy of the back. This is the front, that's the back, these are the bones in the back, and those are the discs. These, and we're seeing the back from the side once again. These are normal discs. That's kind of what a painful disc would look like. You can see it's collapsed, you see the edema and swelling, which is the white. And the way we fix that is once we find it on the MRI, then we take the tube down and we put in a new plastic disc. And this is actually what it looks like. This is actually from a surgery. This is what we use to put it in with. That doesn't stay in the patient, but this does stay in the patient. The disc is radiolucent, so they put markers in it so we can tell where it is. And this is another example. Here you see a patient on their side. We're actually looking down from the top. This is the front, that's the back. You can, that looks like a painful disc. You can see how it's kind of worn out. This is a normal looking disc and once again what we do is we take a tube down, we find that disc and we replace it with a plastic disc and you wind up with an incision that looks like that. Uh -huh. Now another way we'll do that sometime is that other technique that I mentioned where we'll take the tube, we'll go down, we'll clean it out with the tube put in a, uh, a balloon and then fill that balloon full of stem cells under very high pressure. Sometimes you have to use the cage, sometimes you can use the balloon, different situations, but uh, a little, probably take too long to explain to you tonight and everybody would go to sleep, but that's just two different options. And this is actually what it looks like. You wind up with an incision that looks like this. We close it with a little bit of skin glue, can take a shower the same day or a bath, and then this is what it looks like in the body. You can see kind of the stem cells put in there and it's restored the normal height and alignment. So this is without, and you see the shadow there that looks like a ball. The next thing I was gonna talk about is called spinal malalignment or spondylolisthesis. It's probably one of the most common things we see. And what we're looking at is an MRI, an x-ray, and just a drawing of spinal malalignment. Here you see the bones. They should all line up, but you can see this bone has slipped on that one. When it does that, it basically blocks off the spinal canal, and that's one of the most common causes of sciatica. And once again, sciatica is pain in the back, buttock, and leg. I usually will say that a couple of times because I've gotten complaints at the end of the talk. You didn't say what sciatica is, so now I kind of say it a few times. <laughs> and then the way we fix that is, once again, put down the tube, put in a new plastic disc that restores the normal height and alignment. In the old days, this is the way we would do it. If somebody came in with this, we would make a big incision on the back, remove the back half of the spinal cord, move the nerves out of the way to get in a big disc, and lock it in place, something like that. And you'd wind up with an incision that looks like this, and a lot of hardware in the back. 
Much better to have a plastic disc and a little incision, which I've heard people say is half the length of my thumb. <laughs> And then the last thing I was going to tell you about is scoliosis. Now this is degenerative scoliosis. What happens is as people age, you can wear out the disc, but the discs don't always wear out evenly. They can wear out more on one side than the other side. Just like with a pair of shoes, when you're walking, you can kind of start to wear out the outside of the shoe and then your weight shifts to that side and then it wears out even faster. That's what happens with the disc. One wears out on one side, that causes the next one to wear out, and the next one, and the next one. And the way we fix that is, once again, so we're looking at the spine, it should be straight, and here you see a curve. When it's curved, it can pinch the nerves, once again, causing sciatica, back, buttock, and leg pain. And what we can do is make an incision on the side, take a tube down, and with that tube, we do the same thing, but we put a disc at one level and then point the tube at the next level and then the next level, all through the same incision. So you can put in several different discs all through the same one. You don't have to have a separate incision for each disc. In the old days, once again, we would make an, if you had a curve like this, we wanted to straighten, we would make an incision all the way up and down the back put screws and rods all the way up and down the back. You can imagine how long it takes this guy to get over this. In fact, if he's still alive, he's probably still complaining. But the surgery went well. <laughs> and we can also do it for kyphosis, where somebody's bent like this. In the old days, we would uh, do this. But of course, if you put a new disc in there, that's going to straighten up in all the different planes. If somebody's bent like this, it will straighten them up. If they're bent to the side, it'll straighten them up. So once again, you put in a disc and wind up with a small incision. People always want to know what we put inside the cage. We do use stem cells, but these are stem cells that are actually a line of stem cells that have been cloned from adults. There's no babies that have been injured in the making of these stem cells. So it's some stem cells we have shipped in from out of town. They have no antibodies, so, so, there's, uh, so they can be in, given to anybody. And also they've been used for a long time, so there's no infections or anything like that and that you're not going to catch anything from those stem cells. Um, but the most important take home thing is we didn't hurt any babies. <coughs> People also want to know, well, what are my limitations when this is done? Once that disc heals, it's then going to be the strongest disc in your body. So you're not going to break it. People want to know, can they go shopping again? Yes, you can go shopping again. We've had people go back and cage fight again. So if they can go cage fighting, I think you can go shopping. And let's see. Oh, there it is. Um, once again, if you want to follow us, we have two web pages. We have El Paso Spine dot center, which nobody can find because it's dot center, but I call that our video website, which we'll have hopefully this video up on. Even though you've seen it, you may want to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have El Paso Spine Center dot com, which is a typical dot com site. You can follow us and friend us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. We're on it, so um, hopefully that answers some questions. And does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. What, what makes your choice between using the plastic disc or the, or the stem cells you mentioned both? Well, sometimes you have to use the cage if it's something you just really want to force something back in place. So you might use that if it's really a, a situation where the bone is very, very rigid. Um, but there's also cases where you might want to use the balloon if the bone is really, really soft. Um, for example, the other day I had a patient who was on dialysis and had a slip of four or five. She'd been in the hospital for a while and can't move. People on dialysis, their bones get really, really soft. And one of the problems we've had in the past is if we want to put those bones back in place, it's kind of like trying to move a stick of butter with a hot knife. It's like, how do you do it? It's almost impossible. So if you try to put a cage in that level, 
what happens is the cage just bites into the bone. So it may lift the bones apart, but then it just kind of collapsed down and mother nature wins. So now what we do is we clean that area out and we put in a balloon and we fill it up like a water balloon. And then that evenly distributes the pressure over all the surfaces. And that will, that hydraulic pressure, you can actually lift it up and separate it in that case. So that's a case you'd kind of have to use the balloon. Um, the hydraulic pressure can be very strong and it's the best way to evenly distribute all the pressure on the bone evenly. Um, if you've ever done any type of carpentry, you know how, it, how hard it is to get something to fit just perfectly when you're dealing with a cage. There's always going to be a spot that rides a little higher than the other spot, you know. If you're trying to like wedge a table or something, you know, and you look at it really close, you'll notice the wedge hits mostly on one side. You know, it's hard to get it just totally flush. But now with the balloon, we've kind of solved that problem in that the force gets divided evenly over all of it. Yes, sir. Is that a permanent fix or will it eventually also start deteriorating for the number of years that you have left? No, it's living tissue, so it's going to live and grow and become part of your body and should last a lifetime. So it'll, the tissue should live as long as you live. What about the plastic? Uh, the plastic also, we fill that full of stem cells, so the plastic itself does not become part of your body, but the stem cells inside of it does and it becomes coated, so that should last a lifetime too. It doesn't mean that you can't break another level or cause some problems at another level, but as far as that level, if, as long as it heals, you won't have trouble with that level again. You. Can you talk about what the stem cells do for the time you insert them? Will... Well now, stem cells, the definition of a stem cell is you can make it kind of grow into whatever you want. In most of these cases, we're making it grow into bone. So it's a way of fusing that level, keeping it from moving. If you have uh, one bone that slipped on the other, we just want to put that back and stick it in place. So we're using it like a type of glue. So it's actually going to grow and stick in there like that. We do have fully mobile disc we could put in there, but the problem with that is when one bone slips on the other, you have little joints in back, and they have a lot of arthritis and stuff too. So if I put a fully mobile jo joint or disc in there, then I would increase the motion at that segment, and those little joints in back um, would be very, very painful. So you have to, even though we are just putting a new disc in the front, you're actually treating the back too. You're stopping the motion in those little joints in, in back. <coughs> yes, ma'am. What about if, if you have a pacemaker and can you still have an MRI? You can't have an MRI, but there's other studies that we can do. That you can do, yeah. You know, so, but you can't have an MRI. Maybe one of, that's, a, that's something they need to work on, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you do a high, uh, a high number of uh, surgeries having to do with chronic uh, tailbone pain? I don't do, a, well, everybody has some tailbone pain. I always use the example that, um, you know, classically lower back pain gets radiated to the tailbone. If you get an old medical textbook, they actually have chapters in there about a surgery to take out the tailbone to treat that. Nowadays, nobody does that, of course, because it didn't work. When I trained, there were still some older surgeons doing that. So I can remember going in and having them take out part of the tailbone wasn't a very fun thing to do because where it's located, a very high percentage of those get infected. So then they come back in and you got to do dressing changes and stuff. Um, but so nowadays we don't take out the tailbone too much, but everybody gets some pain down to the tailbone. So do you think it'd be worth a trip to see you? My, my daughter's the one that has a problem. Uh, I don't know, you know she's got an, uh, an MRI that told her degenerative arthritis. She got it through, uh, as young, and, uh, when she was in also through an accident, but they rated her on the total. And ever since then, she's had chronic pain. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly be happy to look at her. You know, if it's, uh, now, having said that, some people actually break their tailbone and they have some, uh, you know, some problem in the tailbone, that's a different issue. Then we basically take out the piece of tailbone that never healed back. 
anybody that has tailbone pain has to initially, there's kind of a protocol we follow. You have to be seen by a gastroenterologist to make sure it's not something in the rectum because they're just right together there. There's essentially like, if you look at the tailbone and the rectum itself, there's just like a little tiny bit of tissue between those two, you know. And the last thing, just by coincidence, when she had the tailbone and they rear her car, uh, around that time she got paramelagia, it started about the time, so we don't even know if it's paramelagia or that, that but she's had the chronic pain waiting for that. Okay. Yeah, sometimes with fibromyalgia you can get tailbone pain, in which case doing surgery on it's not going to help. You know, it would probably make it worse. Oh, yeah. Be happy to see her, certainly. Yes, ma'am? First of all, I am fascinated. <laughs> we have come a long way. Oh, really? Where are you from? Well, Dr. Smith, I've worked with you in the early 90s, and uh, we have really, really come a long way with our Oh, okay, I see. But uh, I am just fascinated with it. But I was wondering, what is, um, if any, the rejection rate um, with the plastic, body rejecting the plastic and the stem, the stem cells? Well, officially, it's zero. So they don't, I mean, there's never, never really been a, a documented case of uh, it being rejected, though I'm always a skeptic. There might be somebody out there that something's happened to. And uh, as far as the peak, there's a whole nother talk about that. You know, with the peak, what we do is we kind of match it to the patient. So um, if you look at like somebody's bendability of their bone, or we call it modulus of elasticity, if there's an engineer in, in here, probably knows more about it than I do, but we try to match the bendability of the cage to the modulus of elasticity of the bone so you don't get a big mismatch. Uh, just like the example I talked about a minute ago, you know, you don't want to try to move a stick of butter with a hot knife, you know, so you want to match those two as close as you can, otherwise one will cut through the other one. Certainly do, yeah. Now, in the, uh, in the cervical spine, we use a lot more fully mobile discs. So usually we're going to do minimally invasive, but put a disc in there to give you mobility back. And there's different reasons for that, but in the neck, you want more mobility so that you can, like, back out of the driveway, stuff like that. So it's really uncommon that we're going to fuse it. Don't use plates and screws, anything like that. Usually some form of mobility. In the lower back, we have the same thing we could do, but we don't use them as often because it's not really a need to. Um, every now and then, we will do one if somebody just insists, but there's really only two people that ever insist in the lower back in a fully mobile disc. One seems to be, uh, every now and then, somebody will come up for more as, and just that's what they want, and they have to have it. And, they, and then we'll do it. Oh, okay, yeah. And then the other one seems to be football coaches. Sometimes coaches, you know, we've done several coaches in town that had to have a fully mobile disc. And I think it's because they, they think they know everything, you know, but, and I know everything. But um, in the lower back, if you look at like, say the bottom level, 5S1, by the time you get to our age, in the normal population in the city, you have like one or two degrees of motion. So doing a big surgery, and we use a fan and steel incision, the same thing they do to do a C-section, to put a fully mobile disc in there to give you eight degrees of motion in the city when nobody else has that much. It's just, it's a big surgery that's not needed. I mean, what you want is you want something that restores the normal height and alignment and lasts a lifetime, you know. Now in the neck, I think it's worth it, you know. And how quick can I get in to see you? <laughs> I'm heading back over there now. <laughs> now I'll give you my cell number, you can give me a call. <laughs> yes, ma'am? We take most everything. I mean, the only thing I think we really don't take is uh, Medicaid. But, but M Medicaid. Medicare, no. I mean, the insurance do cover this? Um, classic Medicare is really good. You know how cell phone technology has changed? Medicare has changed more. <laughs> I always think about when I first, first came to town. Like, the best thing you could have was Medicare. Didn't pay the doctor a lot, but as a patient, it was like crazy good. You know, you could basically do whatever you wanted for that patient. I, I could walk in the hospital and say, you know, they need a suntan, fly them to Miami, and they'd say, what time? You know, nowadays it's like, 
Well, they had both of their knees replaced. Can they get rehab? No. How about a walker? No. You know, but it's just amazing how much, it used to be carte blanche, you know. They didn't pay the doctor much, but you could get rehab, anything. And the reason I mention that is because it kind of it goes down in steps. Um, if you have classic Medicare, you can get any of this. If you have some of the managed plans, they only use cadaver bone. So it's like... Does he have any co cost on them? Um, you now it depends on which one, but it's actually to Medicare. It's pretty expensive. Of course, I don't own the equipment or anything, so I get the standard Medicare fees. Um, um, you know, I don't know exactly, but probably our hospital administrator could tell you. You know. Yes, sir. Yes. Are there any disqualifiers such as age or uh, autoimmune diseases, maybe even osteoporosis or previous back Um Now, as far as um, you'd have to look at each case on an individual basis. If somebody had too much osteoporosis, then possibly we couldn't do it. Most of the people that get this are older. They do have osteoporosis. Now, people on dialysis, their bones get really, really thin. I mean, you can just touch them and they'll break a leg. Um, and then we have ways of dealing with that. Um, most autoimmune diseases, as far as like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, stuff like that, are very good candidates. Um, but now, if you have an autoimmune disease that interferes with your immune system, then um, it would be up to the, your hematologist. It, then it depends upon your albumin level, your white blood cell count and stuff. That would be more of a decision of Dr. Bogosian, who's sitting behind you there. <laughs> she would give us the feedback on that, you know, if they, if they meet the criteria. Back to the Medicare, you said the traditional is better than the well, Yeah, now, um, well see, I gotta be really careful what I say. <laughs> so, uh, because enrollment time is new, it's coming up. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to check with my office because I don't do that exactly, but some of the ones, even some you'd think would be really good, like uh, the city's Aetna, for example. They don't... Humana? What about like Humana? Um, Humana, I think they're a little on the difficult side. So, um, and I can't remember if it's Cigna or Aetna that, but two companies just announced that they uh, are only using cadaver bone, which really... You know, we haven't used that since I don't know when, you know, but uh, um, most, the vast majority, you know, Medicare in and of itself will do anything. Um, yeah. What about VA Veterans Administration assignment? Um, now, as a rule of thumb, the VA is very good. You know, they will, uh, for us, they're... They have sent us out to, uh, you know, like Dr. Meisenheim uh -huh. or other that I wanted. Do you need a referral? Now, for you to be a senior? now, in most cases, like if it's through the VA or something, then you do. You know, it all depends on everybody's insurance. But uh, yeah, the VA is usually very good about covering things. You know, okay. once again. Do you take the assignment if we were to request it from a primary. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we do. Yes, okay. all those. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is there an age? You know, they haven't really got into that too much. I think that may be the next step. Um, but I do it just basically based upon the individual because the variation in that is so amazing. You know, I'll see somebody and I'll look at them and I'll think, man, they're too old to have surgery and I'll look at it and they're younger than I am. So it's <laughs> spoils my whole day. And then I always tell the story about the lady that was in the hospital with horrible pain. She could barely roll over and... Um, on the chart, it said she was like 85. And so I did the surgery and she came back to the office and uh, she's doing well and she told me, she said, you know, when I 
got my uh, Social Security, they messed up. They put the wrong age on. You wouldn't have done the surgery if you knew I was 96, would you? <laughs> and she was really nice. I haven't seen her in a while, but um, she, she lived at a nursing home around here, and so she went and told all of her buddies how she was doing, and they all came in. <laughs> And it would be, it was like really funny because I'd have this little lady or little man that came in wanting their back fixed. And I talked to him, I said, well, how bad's your back pain? Well, last week, and I think two weeks ago, I took a Tylenol. <laughs> it's like, okay, you keep taking that Tylenol, you know. But, but there's not really an age limit. It depends upon, I have everybody cleared by their family doctor. As long as they can pass all the health screening and stuff and they look active enough, then, then we would do it. And uh, you know, as surgeries have gotten less and less invasive, you can do them on older people. You know, some of these, I hate to say, are almost kind of like a fancy injection. Um, in the old days, you would never think of doing a fusion on somebody you know, in their late 80s or something. But nowadays, you'll do it because um, you know, they can tolerate it well. Just like we used to set limits on how big somebody was, you know, you wouldn't do it on somebody. But nowadays it really doesn't affect us, so you don't have the weight limits or the age limits as much as you used to. So it's kind of expanding, you know, what we do. Uh, yes, sir? Well, now the robot is a guidance system. So a lot of times we won't use it. There are certain times it's really useful. If, for example, somebody has scoliosis and I have to get to a spot and we have live action TV or x-ray and we're looking at it and everything looks all jumble and it's like, where do you think that cage goes? Well, then you're gonna let the robot decide, you know. No. We, Exactly, yeah. because you got to set it up and you use it and stuff. Um, and somebody that's really big, where it's like, I'm not sure I can reach that, then you're going to let the robot do the hard work. But for something we do so often, I mean, we can do it in 30 minutes and it takes us an hour to turn on the robot, you know, so it's like, don't always use it. Um, so I used to joke and say, you know, it really helps in like bigger people. So if you're a little heavier, then we might insist on using it. But if I see in the office and I tell you we're going to use the robot, that's not why we're using it on you, okay? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. No, you would just do one at a time. You do one, see how you're doing, and then come back and do the other one. Really, you always want to do, as a rule of thumb, you want to do the least amount that you can get away with at a time. And people tolerate two separate little tiny surgeries better than one kind of big surgery. You know? My problem is with my neck is that uh, it's been uh, 18 years ago. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh, and they cut everything, you know, the nerves, the muscles, and everything else. And they went through the back. And they went through the back. Yeah. And uh, my, uh, it was good for a while, but now my pain has come back, and I, my, I get very little sleep at night. Well, most likely. Typically what they do is they will fuse a couple of levels and then you break down either above or below those levels and that level starts choking off. And in most cases what we do is we actually go through the front. And there's a couple of reasons to do that, but one, it's not very painful. 
like when I touch like that, I'm actually touching the bone. So we cut the muscle and we go between these. I mean, we cut the skin and go between the muscles so you're not cutting any muscles. And then we put a new disc below where the fusion was to give you some mobility back at that section. Um, those are actually very successful. But really, well, I have to see what you have. I don't want to say that. <laughs> That's another thing I never say. <laughs> You'll be quoting me all over town. Yeah, and I'd be happy to look at it, but that's usually what happens. People do good for a long time, and then they begin to break down at the next level, and you have to have that level fused. That's one of the advantages of getting an artificial disc, because if in the future you have trouble and it breaks down, you're still at the same level. You just put a new one at the same level. You don't keep adding levels, you know. Yes, sir? So uh, it means that uh, you have to go through three different surgeries if you have, like, one, two, three, and four, with you mean in like the lower back? Yes, sir. No, you could do all three of those at the same time, but if you had one in the thoracic and one in the neck, those would be two different surgeries. Okay, so, but you know. You would do all three in one. <coughs> yeah, and just depends. Sometimes, if somebody looks a little bit frail, I will divide things up a little bit. Right. So um, suppose. We look at it and they have a disc at one level that I got to go from here and a disc on the other place that I have to go from there. Well, you could potentially do those at the same time, but because we have to completely use a different setup, and you could really do it through the same setup, but I'm kind of superstitious. So if I make one incision, then I close that incision, clean the whole room, do it all over again, and do it for the second one. Just be, and really, you could just go to the other side, but it's just bad mojo. So I just don't do that. So if I break it down and we've closed this one, then usually what I'll do is I'll wait and maybe the next day or something do the other one, have them walk around a little bit. So if somebody has two different levels, I might like do one on a Friday morning. There's 30 minutes of surgery. Have them walk around, talk to them that afternoon, the next morning, see if they're still hurting from the other disc do the other one Saturday morning, have them walk around Sunday and go home Monday. That's kind of an unusual situation, but that way, you know, it's somebody's in the, I always say it's like three days in the hospital and an hour worth of surgery, but that way I get to see how they're doing, you know. Uh, yeah, or it could even be a little less than that sometimes. I usually, now, if you look at like the typical, like one of the ones where you put a cage in, suppose you're getting a cage at four or five, the surgery itself probably takes maybe an hour, but the setup takes about that time. So the average from the time you roll back to the time I walk out and talk to the family is we're running at about two hours and 15 minutes now, and that includes everything. What type of anesthesia do you use? Um, we use general anesthesia. I know some people do it under local anesthetic, but I think it's kind of like going to the dentist and getting your wisdom tooth pulled. If he offers the gas, take the gas, you know. Um, it's just, it's more pleasant for everybody. It's faster. Um, if you do it under... recovery after that? You mean... Well, you know, everybody's a little different than that. I mean, I think we have very good anesthesiologists, but... You know, I think I'd rather, you know, be nauseated a few days or in the afternoon as well, opposed my to... My husband, when he had the surgery, it took him almost a month for the anesthesia. Yeah, well, part of that depends. I mean, they can adjust the anesthesia. Plus, one of the advantages of this is it's quick, so it's not that much anesthesia, you know. Um, if you have, if you're under anesthesia half a day, then it builds up in your system. Um, though it kind of, it's inversely proportional to the individual. So like uh, skinny people really don't tend to be as involved, have as much trouble with it as other people. If you're a little overweight, then that anesthesia seems to build up in all the tissues and then it kind of comes out over a few days. Is yes, sir? Is robotic procedure, uh, can be used on any part of the spinal column? Uh, any place. Well, we use it mostly in the lower back, but you could do scoliosis all up and down the spine. Um, but we use it mostly on the lower back and any place we want to put a screw, pretty much. Yes, ma'am. 
I want to know where you get your stem cells, and is there a place in El Paso that um, has the ability to take our own stem cells? Uh, I'm sure they can take your stem cells. We don't do it that way because this is so successful and taking your own stem cells is a little bit painful sometimes. Um, they do do that like if you have somebody you're donating to that, you know, things like if they have like some bone marrow disease or something like this. But there's, this is probably better to use these because it comes from out of town, you don't have no worry, it works. I've never seen it not work, you know, so why you'd want to go through a whole nother painful procedure and stuff. Um, I think if you're helping your sister who has cancer, then I would donate my own stem cells, but for something like this, I don't think I would. Is there uh, any other doctor in El Paso that uses stem cells? On and off. I know uh, Dr. Heideman on his kids uses them uh, to rebuild, like if they have defects. Um, is it Dr. Robert Araya here in town? uses some stem cells. Uh, somebody mentioned Meisenheimer. He probably does, but I'm not certain. Um, what else? Yeah, with the actual stem cells, we have them shipped from out of town. And if you look at my website, they have all the information in case you want to look at the company. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's through Nuvasive. Um, and the stem cells come in a little bottle and they have to be kept very cold. In fact, we have a refrigerator that's negative 81 degrees Celsius, the coldest one in the Southwest. And they actually ship it into town packed in dry ice. So for a little bit of uh, stem cells, we'll get like 50 pounds of dry ice. And when my kids were still at home, I used to take that dry ice home to them and they would throw it in the pool and do stuff. To this day, if you get on the internet and look dry ice you know, up, and you see kids exploding stuff, that's my kids. <laughs> yes, ma'am? You were talking about the HLIF. You said that you don't like using gates. What don't you like even? Is there an instance in which you have to use gates? Oh, yeah, there's certainly instances you have to use the plates. There's another plate that's actually made of plastic, and we'll use that a lot more frequently. So. It's actually a plate that's made out of peak that goes on there and is more flexible. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons why that is, but if you look at the complications with the device, uh, it has to do with a stiff plate. You'll, you can find cases where somebody has had two cages put in and the bones split. Um, and what happens is if you take a weak bone and you put a plate with uh, two holes in the same bone, then, and then the extra stress from two cages, then it's like lightning. It can run from one cage to one hole to the next hole to the other hole, and the body splits in half. So as a rule of thumb, I never put two holes in the same bone, just having learned that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. On uh, your sciatic operation, it's actually really, really high. Um, I don't know the exact number, but uh, I think most people are very happy. And in this day and age, people are very vocal. So if there's a lot of people out there unhappy, I think they'd get on the internet and let me know. But most people, and there's a lot of, I put a lot of videos on the internet that have had people, you know, had the procedure either recently or in the past. And yeah, that's why you need to follow us on Facebook. You can get a lot of that information. Keep pushing Facebook. <laughs> Yes, sir. Tell me about your website. How do you, what, what do you do to look on here? Um, I can, I'll write it down so you can get it, but elpasospinecenter.com or elpasospine.center. If you, if you go to elpasospine.center, we have a lot of videos. Eventually this video will be up. And also on that site, you can click and see us on Facebook, you know, you name it, everything else. Instagram, every day we're putting up pictures of surgeries we're doing and stuff. A lot of information. I think it has a lot of information. If you have any suggestions, write in, let me know, and we'll put it on there. I'd like, to, oh, yes, sir? What about rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah, rheumatoid arthritis, that's a good, 
It works very well for that too. But rheumatoid arthritis produces all the same things we talked about. I think we're going a little over. They're probably going to ask us to go. Anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And uh, if you have any questions, you can come up here. Thank you. <laughs> I have some cards if anybody wants one.